Hey folks, it's Wade, DC VanMarker.com here, and today we've got your sports technology focused review of the Skydio R2 drone. Now, if you've been around the channel a few years, you may remember the Skydio R1 drone that I had way back in, I guess, two years ago, uh, and that was the most impressive sports tracking drone out there. Now, don't get me wrong, I love my DJI drones just like the next person, but when it comes to tracking sports autonomously, even the latest ActiveTrack 2.0 isn't super awesome, especially with any sort of obstructions, and it kind of falls apart. The R1 originally, and this is the R2, but the R1 originally uh, was super impressive in that regard, but there were still some gaps. One, it was pretty darn big, about the size of a pizza box, so not super practical. Number two, there's no way to track you when it lost any sort of visual identification of you. They've solved it this time around with something called a beacon, which is basically this little GPS transponder, transmitter, that you can put on your person or on whatever you have, object that you want to track, and it'll go ahead and track that when it loses the visual recognition of a person. And number three, if you wanted to use the drone for like normal drone stuff, not just sports stuff, it really wasn't awesome for that. You had a, a very basic kind of controller on the phone itself, but no like separate controller. So they've solved that with the R2 by having a dedicated controller right here. Uh, so I've been testing it now for a little while, and I've got plenty of footage I'm going to show you across all sorts of sports, how well it tracks in kind of easy settings as well as really, really hard settings, uh, and just to kind of dive through all that fun stuff. And even a comparison head to head with the uh, one of the DJI drones doing their actual track to show you how that works as well. But first, let me just give you a quick primer on the unit itself. So in the base bundle, you have the drone and a battery in this case. Uh, so essentially, you have this right here, where you've got the battery, one drone, one battery, USB-C charger, 65 watt uh, adapter right there, and then an extra set of props that goes in the case. The carrying case comes with it, 999 bucks, thousand bucks. If you want an extra battery, it's I believe sort of 100 bucks, something like that. And then if you want the controller, it's 150 bucks, and the beacon is also 150 bucks. So, you know, accessory wise, we'll get to what you'll need at the end, but this is a starting point right here, and then you just expand out from there. On the bottom of the drone, you'll see two SD card slots. The one on the left-hand side right here is where your videos and photos and all that goodness goes. And the right-hand side is where diagnostic logging goes. You'll also notice there are six cameras plus the recording camera. So these are optical avoidance cameras now at 4K. Versus previously, they're actually at 720p. So it's a massive jump up in how it avoids uh, objects. And they're saying something like 10 million operations per second, which is completely crazy. But you got one right there, two, three, flip it over four five six and then the front camera that's actually recording you at 4k 60 in hdr mode uh, and you can also go down to 1080p and up to 120 frames per second so with that quick primer let's go ahead right outside and get straight into it we're going to start off with running and then from there we'll go to road cycling on actual roads and then we'll go to road cycling in some pretty interesting spots uh, and then from there we'll go into mountain biking we'll just keep on stepping this up and, and see how well it handles and it will run on the path i have no idea where i'm going to run we're just going to run aimlessly run through some trees see how well it tracks uh, it's basically as simple as that so all you do is hold down the takeoff button right there it'll go ahead and take off there we go and now once I'm in the air I just go ahead and tap myself that little blue dot every blue dot that you see a little blue plus plus there indicates something you can track then I can choose what side I want to be on, back, left, right, forward. I can change the height. I can go up, for example, or go down if I want to, to reduce the height. I can change the range. Uh, so I'm going to go up a little bit higher, just about chest level or so, and leave the range just about where it is. I'm going to go ahead and now take this phone. You can see I just closed it right there, shut it off. Uh, I'll put it into a display off lock screen. Snap it in my pocket, and we'll get rolling here. So come on, little buddy. So here we are cruising along now. You can see the drone behind me. No problem there. Just running along at a nice pace through the trees here. Plenty of width still right now. So I mean, we're talking probably four meters across of width. Uh, so we'll find some nice tight spots up in just a moment here though. here see how it handles this I hear it behind me that's all that matters
Now, this is where I suspect we're gonna lose it. It's pretty slick in here. The mud's pretty deep. See if we can get through here. Can I find this way? Oh, I think it's met as match. Oh, it's got me. Now the, see, it's these little branches there that are tricky for it. You gonna do it? Come on, you can do it, little buddy. Hey, there we go. I'm still here. Ooh, it's a little tight getting there. Boom. Oh, my running shoes are gonna be awesome here soon. Uh-oh. I think we have met its match. Whoa. Did not see that one coming. And make it under this. Okay, here's the ultimate test, I think. Okay, so as you saw with the running, it did well until I got really deep into those super thin trees there, and then it definitely struggled a little bit, which is pretty much what I saw last time with the R1. When I talked to Scottio about this, one of the things I noted is that the bubble around the drone, which is still a one meter bubble, hasn't changed from the R1 to the R2. Let's head out onto the road now, road riding, and show you a little bit of a clip there, just in a more open space. So an open train like this, no problems at all, whether it be from behind or even in front like it is right now, it tracks really, really well. Even around these curves, it just kind of keeps right where you want it to be. Okay, so that was too shabby. Well, now let's go ahead into the trees a little bit. Uh, still on road bikes, cruising along pretty quickly here, about 20 to 25 miles an hour with three cyclists. So there's an opportunity for the visual tracking to get mixed up a little bit. So even right here where I go ahead and separate from the other three, I'm wearing the red jacket, of course, which you may think, well, that makes it a little easier. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Next one I've got here is the beacon step. I'm gonna go ahead and change the view. So I've got it in front of us right now. And I just told it to go behind us. And you can see it's struggling a little bit because of the fact that the trees are so close right above it. You'll just see as soon as it whips back around there, but boom, it executes that, slows down slightly, and then goes ahead and it catches up. Super, super cool stuff. On this next shot here, we slowed down, we told it to get to the side. So I wanted to run down this channel of trees while filming us. And it's just really incredible what happens here. And then just for the fun of it, I keep on trying to change the camera views. And you'll see it struggle for a second, like right here where it goes, oh, I gotta slide through these trees over to here. And I'm basically telling it to go to the left side and the right side. I'm just making a mess of things just for the fun of it, purely to see what it can pull off. And this is astounding. You watch it, it avoids branches, except not entirely. Right there, it hits the branch, but that's no big deal. Keeps on going. Back in the middle here, it temporarily, you know, kind of says pause and catch it back up to us. But this is super, super cool. This is also why I think the beacon is so useful because of the fact that in those gaps there, it can go ahead and just speed back up to catch back up to us and then be good to go. And I mean, just look at this. Now it's re got uh, visual tracking, really, really cool. For this last road bike testing here, what I've got is us going up onto a bridge. And this is just fascinating. I'm changing the camera views. Every time you see me touch my handlebar in the middle there, right there, that's me changing the camera view. And I'm going ahead and put it off the side. Uh, and it just, it's real. This is like one of the coolest shots that I think we have on the road bike, especially as it's avoiding trees, the bridge itself, um, all this stuff. Really, really, really cool. Uh, especially we're around this corner right here. So watch this right in between the trees, avoiding that there while still tracking me. You can see it's got visual tracking right now. Uh, and then of course the other cyclist pulling behind me there. Continuing our forward march here, we're gonna go into mountain biking. Uh, we're gonna start off a bit easy and then we're gonna go into the trees and see how well it tracks. You'll see here in the straightaway, there's no real issues. There's no problem going around these trees, which is why you see that kind of really speed up right there. And then it slows down as it's trying to get around some of these higher trees. But inside the depths of the forest, it's a different story. You'll see it's going very, very slowly right here, still visually tracking me, but in a second, it can't figure out how to get past these trees. And it just kind of decides to keep on tracking me with the camera, but it can no longer, of course, pass through the section there. And this is what we saw time and time again in the denser forest like this. It just simply couldn't handle this kind of terrain. In fact, as I double back to try to get the drone unstuck, here's what happened. In fact, I'll let Des narrate this particular portion for you. It is really dense though, so this is ridiculously challenging. It's actually hitting a lot of branches right now. And, and it's down. 
Don't worry though, the drone was just fine. It went on to fly many more flights without issue. But what about the beacon? So how would the beacon have solved some of that? Well, what we saw out there was that essentially the beacon gave it an escape route. Uh, so if it couldn't visually track me anymore, it got itself back out of that pickle somewhere, it would use a GPS from the beacon to go ahead and keep on tracking. And the way the beacon works is once you turn it on, it has a GPS lock on the beacon itself, as well as the drone, and it communicates between the beacon and the drone using long range radio. So up to about three kilometers or so, so quite a distance more than the roughly 100 meters from the phone. And this allows it to say, you know what, I've lost the visual tracking of someone, and you actually see it on the beacon itself, you see it iterate through the different steps. But I'm gonna go ahead and maintain the GPS tracking. So at which point it drops what it's doing and it simply flies to catch up to you, and it tries to track what it thinks is your spot GPS-wise before then it reacquires you visually and then locks back onto that. And overall that works mostly well. Uh, I would say like the actual tracking in the trees there isn't quite perfect and that may be some of the GPS kind of signal strength on this, but it's not like you could see in the trees every single time like some of the marketing videos Skydio had. Uh, it did do that sometimes, but most of the times it was just sort of in the general vicinity where I was before it locked back on again. Still, I would say this is super important for people buying this drone. I, would, I wouldn't recommend buying the drone without buying the Beacon if you're primarily using it for sports. Uh, if you're using it for something else, then obviously that's fine. But for sports, I think this is critical in order to gain back control in cases that it may be further away range-wise than your phone. So about now you may be wondering, how does it compare to DJI's active tracking technology? And I've of course done many videos, countless videos on every single drone DJI has in active tracking technology. Uh, and so for today, I went out with the Mavic Air. You may be saying, well, wait, the Mavic Air has Active Track 1.0, the Mavic 2 has 2.0, and that's true. And 2.0 is undoubtedly better than 1.0. It's not like Scotio better, but it's definitely better. But price is an important factor here. The Mavic Air is roughly between eight and 900 bucks, compared to the Mavic 2 is 1700 bucks when it's not on sale. That's, that's a huge difference compared to 999 right here. So I think it's more fair to compare the Mavic Air with the R2, at least at this price point. Um, if you're in Europe, that may be different, but the R2 isn't available in Europe. Okay, so what's my final summary here on the R2? Uh, number one, it's without question the best sports tracking drone in the industry today. There's really no comparison there. Uh, when you wanna do you know, solo tracking of yourself or of friends, whatever the case is, where you want it to autonomously track you. There's, there's simply no competition there. Number two, I think having the beacon is definitely required. It gets you out of those pickles. Uh, you can use your phone, and I use my phone for many of uh, flights here with this, um, just fine. But when you got in the trees and you end up going out of range of something, like if it got stuck because it couldn't figure out how to get around something uh, due to clearance issues, having the beacon as a way to as a safety net effectively for getting your drone back uh, is sort of important, especially if you've gone quite a ways from it. So I definitely recommend the Beacon. For the controller itself, I've used this a little bit, but uh, for what I do, I'm not really using this drone as my like day-to-day daily driver drone for you know landscape shots and stuff like that. You can absolutely do that. I've done this, it works great, but it's not not really what I want this particular drone for. But if you do, the, the controller is there for you. Uh, so that's certainly an option as well. The one downside of this drone is still the size. You know, if I compare it to a Mavic Air, the Mavic Air can fold up a little more. I can stick it in my back pocket quite easily uh, versus this one, you can't fold it in any way, shape or form. It puts in this little carrying case right here. This case though does fit in all of my backpacks without any issue, which is great. So some of the backpacks I go cycling with or even trail running with, it fits in that, no issues as well. So it's not the end of the world. I just wish it was just, just wish it could fold. If it could fold, it'd be amazing. As far as batteries go, I would definitely recommend two batteries. Uh, the batteries do hold up. So they say 23 minutes of battery life. Uh, and I would say they're in that ballpark. I'm getting like close to 20 minutes or so. Uh, and I'm running it to the very end and it's pretty darn cold out here, just close to freezing. So uh, I think that's a very realistic battery claim. Okay, there you go. A complete look at the Scotty R2 drone. If you found this interesting, do not forget to whack that like button at the bottom there or the subscribe button. I appreciate it and stay tuned for plenty more sports technology goodness.